You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Uh, yes, year, last year, I didn't realize that I actually started a tradition when we uh, did a little live stream meet and greet here. Uh, today, we have a bunch of topics that we're going to be talking about, have an open mic too, so whoever wants to come in and sit down and just talk, shoot the shit a little bit, we can do that. Uh, we got a fun schedule today. So from all the nine people, 10 people watching, can I get a mic check? How do I sound? Do I need to adjust my levels before we get in here? Let me know. Again, guys, I'm sorry that I started late. We were supposed to be starting at uh, noon, but you know, I'm late to everything. I was also up late last night with our spirits and ghost stories, Christmas Eve special. Uh, Carly told a insanely dark story that made me really fear Christmas carolers. Didn't know that could get there. And also the importance of getting a prenup in your, in your marriage. If you'd like to know about that, go on over to the channel. You can check that out. Mm. It'll be restreaming later on. Let's see. We got Scott. Good afternoon, sir. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, my good man. All right. Sounds good on Facebook Live. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, again, guys, so I did mention this in, in the comment section below. We might be doing a, a giveaway. I'm pretty sure we are, actually. Yeah, we are. So basically, if you have a question and you ask it on a super chat on the YouTube channel, that enters you into the contest for a little bit of a door prize at the end of our session today. Uh, what we're going to go over today, I have a couple of topics I want to cover, and then we're going to get into kind of the base to be fishing this time of year, and then we'll be kind of taking your questions as we go about it. Then we're going to have a guest appearance by our Jer Jared Mounts, and possibly uh, we'll get Jerry on the show too. Uh, he's here as well. And we'll kind of get into it today. How's everybody doing tonight, by the way, tonight? Uh, how's everyone doing? What is people doing family-wise? Are you guys just relaxing at home? Are you traveling? getting any fishing in i'm telling you what's really crazy is how freaking cold it is out there good lord it got cold i think it was like 17 degrees yesterday and then today it feels like it's like 10 but luckily the wind is not going which is insanely nice and helpful Put that camera right there perfect i get that adjusted that looks good nice now so winter fishing before we get into into that talk, I have some very interesting questions for you guys. Now, this came from Bass Blaster. Um, the first one is, what makes a big fish? You know, we all hear Doc talk and chatter about, well, this thing was like 10 pounds. This thing was 15 pounds. Oh, I caught a smallmouth that was six. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, we all have friends that like, like to exaggerate i mean that's where the stereotype comes from right like the idea that fish stories always grow in size as the years pass and i think that's really interesting and it gets to my my belief that you really just shouldn't unless you have proof like sasquatch you just can't believe it period you know sasquatch doesn't exist until we got real photographic evidence we have real video proof dna proof that this thing existed um you know if you catch a fish it's really hard to believe you on the size of the fish unless you you have some kind of proof of the size and with a measuring board with a scale all this stuff it's so easy to be able to get that stuff like certified and proved now i get it sometimes you're not going to be able to do that and that's why i like when i catch one now if i don't have a scale or measuring board i give like a, a rough range so if i catch a nice small mouth maybe it's between three to five pounds vague around there just something like that i don't know i just thought that was a really cool cool thing to start the show off with is what do you guys think what 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 do you decide is a good fish and do you believe your friends when they tell you tell you it i don't know what what that got me into but let's get into this first article here all right so this one's from black bass blaster and this is i think is, is really interesting uh came up on the bass blaster and i was like oh this this is actually going to be really worth talking about here um the first one is having electronic classes in your tourneys so let me blow this up a little bit here perfect so amateur tournament trails i think need to have different electronic classes at least two forward-facing sonar guys and non-forward-facing sonar guys there's nothing wrong with forward-facing sonar but not everyone can afford 10k of electronics slash batteries and not everyone wants to fish that way and we need our tournament guys to still fish and kids from modest means to be able to compete. I 
you know, he's he's hitting he's hitting it right on the head there. Um, again, this is the Bass Blaster. If you guys get that Jay Kumar's thing, it's a very interesting article here talking about. And I've heard this before, especially from like the crappie guys about having two tournament formats, two tiers, the forward facing sonar crowd and the non forward facing sonar crowd. And it's really interesting that debate. And I can hear both sides of it where you have guys that are 100 percent. You, you have it all for it. Love it. Then you have the other side. It's like it's it's cheating. It's it's too much technology. It takes you away from your roots. The idea of having this this class system makes a lot of sense to me. It really does. Uh, the reason being is it comes down to money. I, I don't think forward facing sonar is going to go anywhere. It's here to stay. Nothing's going to change. The electronics industries are such a big portion of the pie when it comes to the, the financial backbone of this industry. I don't see that ever going away. And I, and I believe this kind of gets down to what happened in baseball. So about six, seven, 10 years ago, uh, in little league and just the minor league levels, when you had really hot baseball bats, uh, the orange stealth was a great example of this. It was a fantastic baseball bat, but it was hot. And what it meant by hot was the acceleration of the baseball off the barrel. It was insane. And I used to umpire a lot back then. And I used to umpire little league and you could see the change when this bat started to come up through, it cost about four or 500 bucks. It was insanely expensive. The most expensive baseball bat ever made at this time. And you can see a 10-year-old who would barely hit a ball out to the outfield. All of a sudden, he was either hitting the ball out of the park or he was hitting the warning track. The baseball bat was hot, and it made a difference in their ability. It did. It cost a lot of money, though. Now, you might say, like, okay, we need to put in regulations of that ilk, which did happen in baseball. They With the BB core regulations, it said, like, this is how fast the ball is allowed to accelerate off the barrel. But these type of baseball bats are still here. And this is the biggest issue I have with this is the kids that could afford the baseball bat saw an improvement in their skill set, 100%. But not everyone has the ability to afford those things. Or like you said, maybe you want to be a purist and you want to play in a wood bat league. I think the idea of having two tournament formats makes perfect sense for that. And it's not just a electronics forward facing versus non. I think it's more of a financial thing. It is expensive to get forward facing sonar. It is period end of story. I get it that, you know, you can figure out ways to scrape your money together, whatnot. But I think the idea of having a league where it is purely guys that don't have it is going to start catching on. Uh, and in crappie, you were seeing that there are separate divisions of crappie where you have forward facing sonar versus non forward facing sonar. Again, I may be a little biased. I like it. I have it. I'm going to have it on my boat. I'm upgrading to the plus system now. Um, but I think it's a very interesting conversation to have. I really do. I'm going to take these off, guys, because I don't know why I have them on when I'm not talking to anyone here. Um, but no, I, I think it's very interesting. Jared, what do you think about that? Well, Forward facing sonar. Um, yeah. You can sit down there. You can sit there. There, there. I just tilt the, I just move the camera over. It don't matter. Where do you want to sit? You can sit right here. That's fine. Because that's why I have that mic there. You can just pick it up and set it down right there. Yeah, bring it on over. Um, no, I don't know. I think it's really interesting when you when you look at it, guys. There is so much passion over that forward-facing sonar thing. It's absolutely insane. Where you have people that absolutely are in love with it and absolutely just think it's the devil. What I think is interesting, though, is the people that hate it are kind of the ones that don't have it, which to me is kind of telling of the situation. But anyway, there, there's that. And now there's another article here we're going to get into. First, I'm going to get Jared's opinion on this, guys. As far as technology, too, as you bring it up, I don't, I'm not a big electronic guy. I mean, I should be. Uh, I'm just not on the water enough to really dial it in. But we were just talking, I was talking to the customer just a little bit ago. The thing with technology is it happens at set fa such a fast rate. As soon as you come out with the you know, 2022 model, the 2023 is now already in production and, and getting ready to roll out. And so technology is happening at such a fast rate. Um, things get outdated pretty quick. I think it's a tool. Uh, personally, I think it is a tool just like everything else. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say that, you know, kind of like you can knock this technology, but at the same time, like look at the boats that some of these guys are fishing out of, um, you know, and just every, everything, everything that we have, 
that we're using, I mean, it could be said the same thing from back in the day, the old timers, they didn't have half of what we have. Yeah. Now. I mean, remember when people complained <laughs> about, you know, side scan and things mm -hmm. like that. And I, and I was bringing it back to baseball when uh, Easton, I don't know if you remember this, the orange stealth. Yes. Um, yep. And that thing was hot as hell. Yep, and I remember right. playing against it and also umpiring. And it was the first bat, I believe, that broke like four or five hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I would say from a financial standpoint, I understand a little bit because if you gave your 10 year old that bat, mm -hmm. he clearly hit the ball further. Yeah. And it made uh, him look right. better. But not everyone could afford that. Yeah. And, and to think, your point, if you wanted to compete, you, you almost had to go with that. Yeah. It's kind of like using a wooden bat versus you could use a wooden bat and hit for average. But at the same time, you're not going to be able to hit the ball as far. Well, you coach high school. Yeah. Would you tell your player, like, you know, no, go with wood. It's fine. It's yeah, fine. No, it's ridiculous. No, yeah. you would have to use it. And I think so the idea of making a league that's all wood bat or non sonar related, I, that makes sense. And I still, and I think the way the fish, fish's behavior from the standpoint of like those fish can be there. Um, you can find the fish and, and yeah, people are catching more fish because of this technology, but at the same time, it doesn't, doesn't make the fish eat. Mm -hmm. And in other words, too, if you got a high pressure or something and they're just tight lipped or they just ate up, like how many times you, you see fish there, but you, you don't catch them. So there's no, still no guarantees, um, in it. And that's, um, that's the next thing we're going to get into. Cause like, and I thought this was fun cause this was the newest bass blaster thing. And I'm going to read it here for everyone that probably can't see it. So the first thing was, is forward-facing sonar starting to spook fish? Hmm. Been hearing a few more reports about forward-facing sonar spooking fish. Remember that crappy and other fishermen are using this now as well. Will those easy fish, naive to forward-facing sonar, start to disappear? Kind of like the A-rig. Hmm. Um, will those in-between fish, between structure and cover spots, become less easy to catch? I think this is really interesting, and it goes back into John Cox believes that the transducer in of itself does create an issue, and that's why he doesn't like to have one on his boat. John Cox is a no transducer approach, smart in the long run. I think that's really interesting because I think that's true. Travis, um, I actually, guys, I, I pre-recorded a episode this past week with Travis Luger, and we talked about that, and he's still 100% against it. Now, where he's coming from, Travis, and that episode's going to drop here, is going to drop here in a couple of weeks, but he said, like, after fishing the opens, he has to get forward facing sonar because he's going to get his butt kicked mm, otherwise. Right. That's right. But, to be able he, to compete. Yeah. but he also agrees that with forward facing sonar, a lot of people have moved off the bank and those fish are starting to replenish. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's something that you're going to start seeing here as more and more people get it, that those bank feeders are actually going to come back into play. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really do. And guys, we'll get to your questions here in a minute. Don't, don't you worry about and that. the elite guys too. You look in the classic, like there's times they used it and there's times they turned it off and just went fishing. I mean, I think, uh, once his face won at day three, he just turned it off. So I'm just going fishing, mm -hmm. you know, and relied on instincts. Um, and so I think, I think, again, I think it's a tool, uh, that can help you find fish, ultimately catch fish. I think we'll, here's the other thing too, that I like about aside from the competition, I think we're going to learn so much more. Oh, yeah that we didn't know. Like, for example, I've heard guys that use it talk about how far they've seen a fish travel. Mm -hmm. So you're throwing whatever you're throwing and you're seeing this fish come off, you know, of a brush pile and, and moving a pretty good distance to take this, whatever it is, spinner bait, rattle trap, whatever. But you, you wouldn't, whereas another application, you got to get right down in that brush pile, maybe because it's not moving. It's not as aggressive. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I just think fish behavior and what we thought we knew about it and what we're going to learn in the future because we have this technology uh, is, is I think, a plus. I think, yeah. I mean, that was the, that's the coolest thing about it, too, is I feel like everyone believes it's just you're just sniping fish mm -hmm. and you're just looking at them. That's great when it happens, but it just tells you things. So if you show up to a point mm -hmm. and you scan and you see nothing, mm -hmm. you're not going to waste as much time. Right. And take a trout fisherman, too, like where the water's crystal clear. And these guys will throw and, and pretty much put it on its nose. Mm -hmm. And that trout just swims off. And, like, so same type of thing. It's not that not this technology. You can see it. Uh, but it, it went back to my point. It doesn't mean it's going to eat, mm -hmm. you know, every time. So I, did, I think we'll become better anglers because of it. How did you get into trout fishing? I don't think I've ever asked you that before. Oh gosh. I just, for me, it was, I was always a, that seasonal guy that again, fish in the summertime on the river, canoeing, wading. And then, um, you know, that was a summer and then, uh, spring was usually baseball season. So, you know, I didn't usually, we were in season, um, coaching, playing, coaching. Uh, then you moved up into the winter time was for hunting. So I would bow hunt 
uh, rifle hunt, muzzleloader hunt, rifle hunt, pretty much from October to January. And then after January, from January to, to, uh, through the winter, that's when I would usually pick up a fly rod and go trout fishing uh, mm. or do some bird hunting or something. So I was kind of se- a seasonal outdoorsman type thing. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until I stopped coaching, uh, coach for 20 years, 17, 20 years that I actually had the spring time because we would start in February end in May. Um, so, you know, that's, I didn't have the time to fish. So that opened up a whole new thing for me too. Like, you know, just cause dad has a bait shop, you know, I've always said I'm not a great angler, but, uh, because I only fished in the summertime and mm-hmm. fishing is totally different in the different seasons, you know, so I never had the experience well, I'm getting, I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying I never had the experience on Doing the big bodies too, of water. Or, yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, anyway, so it's been, been intriguing, but trout was just another way to, uh, you know, get out, uh, get out and, and fish and catch fish and, you yeah. guys did pretty good this year, right? Like, I mean, I know Smith Mountain Lake, you kicked butt two days in a row. But what did you guys finish up in the points? Uh, we were ninth overall. Um, there was We averaged 20 to 30 boats, you know, per tournament. I think 40 had signed up. But uh, so we were ninth. We got inside the top 10. Um, we're very inconsistent, I think. You know, we'll, we can, we'll be at the top. We could be at a third or fourth or sometimes maybe a first or second. But we're just not consistent. Then we'll drop off and be middle of the pack or the bottom of the pack, you know, mm. type thing. So... Uh, I think we're just going to try to find, develop some consistency day in and day out. And that's hard to find. And hats off to those guys that can run the table and, and consistently be in the top. Uh, that really says something. Now, getting back to like the forward facing sonar, how many guys, is there anyone in the club running forward facing sonar? And so we, we have, do? yeah, we've had a few. I don't, I don't know if I have a number account, but that's the other thing I'm, I'm, I'm hearing too is there is definitely a learning curve. So just to be able to purchase it, buy it, put it on your boat, you yeah. know, get it hooked up, like that's, that's only, that's not even half the battle. You, there's a lot of, you got to get it dialed in. You've got a, uh, there's definitely a learning curve I've heard that goes with that. So some guys that have gotten it, it, it hasn't, you know, produce for them yet. Cause I think they're still learning it. Now, the other thing that we're guys, we're going to cover. And then again, guys, let me know down in the chat below if there's anything that you want me to particularly talk about here um, is entry fees. I thought this was a very interesting thing that Kumar brought up is like entry fees across the board are just going up in price. Um, and that's like with the BFLs too, they're going up. Um, you have bass masters even thinking about bringing up their entry fee prices, but the payouts are not adjusting mm. here what is going on because this has been my thing that i've i've complained about is i really feel like fishing is getting their their branding their image is starting Mm -hmm. i think to go where who are they appealing to because Mm -hmm. if you have a hundred thousand dollar bass boat you know thirty thousand dollars worth of electronics and then you have it where now you have to fish all nine events for the opens it's getting expensive as not to do this like i Mm -hmm. I don't and i get people are paying for it but don't you think that you're going to alienate people especially college kids like i, I don't know like w- since you're in this industry too what are your thoughts on it that's a great question and i don't have an answer to it uh but basically um i don't know i mean everything is i just i see things as an evolution um i mean you look back through the history of Bassmaster. i mean back the original ones they one of the original ones they put them on an airplane and flew them out and they all had the same they provided the boats they weighed their tackle, like you can only take so much tackle. And so uh, you look from that time to today, but then with, you know, other competing uh, major league fishing and, you know, FLW, like you have a lot of different circuits out there. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I, I think what they're, tr- I mean, I understand what you're saying. It's almost, I wonder if they're not trying to make it more available to, more people if that makes sense but mm-hmm. like to your point if it's going to cost you more you're limiting the field um i don't know i mean can it ever get too expensive i've always like i've had this debate with baseball too baseball needs a salary cap at some point right like it can't go up forever eventually mm-hmm. it'd be like a, a player's literally not worth the gdp of africa mm-hmm. like it's just mm-hmm. stupid and i was talking i was debating somebody about the whole juan soto deal and things like that when that went through like it's getting insane when mm-hmm. is the breaking point and i feel like with fishing God, it's got to be coming here soon. Well, but I still, I mean, again, go back to sports. We've talked about this before, but I don't care what sports you're talking about. Baseball, let's take baseball. And you got, you know, you start off in your youth leagues and then you get to, you got your all-stars and you get to high school and you're going to narrow down the field when you get to high school. Not, no, that's true. not yeah. all the kids are going to play and make the team. 
And then you go to college. You're, what are you doing? You're narrowing it down the field again. Mm-hmm. And then you look at uh, professional baseball, and you and I both know, like, you know, yeah, that's great to have that dream. But the the even though there is a lot of players getting played to paid to play baseball, the field narrows as you go up. Mm-hmm. And I think you're you still have the same thing here. And even at the elite level. What's interesting, you know, I was talking to a customer a little bit ago about going to the Classic. If you've never gone to the Bassmaster Classic, highly recommend you do that. Um, but what you find when those guys get up on the stage, you take the percentage of guys that uh, don't have to have a day job and work and that are making that have made it to the point where they don't need that backup job, very, very few. Most all of them either have a full-time job, they're painters, they're selling insurance. Yeah. You know, John Cruz has a bait company, like, you know, they might be doing a social media gig, but my point being is, you know, back to that, like it's in, in a business, your overhead, you've talked about this, like your overhead, your expenses of your boat, of your travel, your fuel, your stay, your food, like, and then you get a check, you, you cut a check, but that check does not cover what your expenses are. So you got to have another source of income, you know, now, and I think that's what you're finding too even in the lower circuit levels, same thing, unless you've got a a great job that can, you can, the two things, number four, it pays you well enough to do this, Mm -hmm. but secondly, gives you the time off that you need to also compete when you figure a week's worth of practice. And and like you say, if you're going nine events, it's, it's not for everybody, I guess. Like at the end of the day, it's just like, and again, in baseball, if, if you're good enough, no matter if you're rich or poor, if you grew up in the slums or in Loudoun County, you know, they're going to find you and they're mm-hmm. going to, they're going to get right. you and you're going to grow fishing right now. It's really starting to feel like it's not about just pure talent. It's, it's about you. Can you actually sign the check? If you make it, you got to be able to afford a hundred thousand dollars. And I feel like that's where eventually <clears throat> that's got to change because I feel like it's more like NASCAR right now where it's kind of like, you just, you need the financial backing. Right. And that's where I would like to see the adjustment eventually. I don't know how you would do that, but and maybe kayaking is the answer because kayaking is that cheaper yeah. alternative. And that's what, um, we know uh, what's his face did I'm drawing a blank, but oh, uh, Nolan Miner, Nolan Miner yeah. his brother, that's what they're doing. <laughs> but same time too, you, you hear these stories of of guys. Hank Cherry was another good example. I mean, he he caught a break. I mean, before he won that classic, like he was working a nine to five job, from what I understand. And it's but back to the, what you're saying though, you still have to be competitive and win. Mm-hmm. You can put up the money, and there's guys out there that have the money are going in with a nice bass boat with all the fancy electronics and all the gear and all everything like that. But if you cannot win, and that's what it comes down to, though, at the end of the day, too, you've got to win to put yourself in a position to be there. So money, back to what you're saying about money, the same thing in in, uh, professional sports. There's a lot of sports out there, teams that are pumping the money in, but it doesn't mean they're making it to the the big show. And you thought about winning. I think this is interesting. So I've always won. I've I've actually never asked you this question. So what's his name over there? Poston. Hostin is his name? Yep, Jeff Hostin. Jeff, would you rather, do you like MLF style format or best five? Jared. Best five. Best five. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because it's the best five. I think it's, it's, I mean, yeah, it's definitely a different thing of uh, catching numbers versus, but size. I mean, you can still catch numbers, but we're going to take the best five out of how many ever fish you catch. Whether you catch five or you catch, 100 you're taking the best five see i that's where it's it's weird to me because the issue i have i like both formats 100 percent. and you guys remember my rant it went viral about the whole issue with mlf right now you know mlf is its own thing it decided it wanted to be a pizza joint it had its main fans and now it's saying like I, we want to be mm-hmm. a vegan restaurant so now what's great is you're not bass and you alienate the people that like you mm-hmm. so we'll have a conversation later I think the issue with the five with me is that there is a cap in which you can no longer physically be able to compete in that tournament. You know, no one's going to, you know, hook a 30 pound bag or whatever. So in a five fish format, there's only so far you can go And every fish counts. I think what's interesting is it's a better viewing experience because you have to keep the pressure on. Hmm. That's number one. Number two, you always have the ability. You have a chance to win. And I think that's what's interesting. In a best five, there is more luck involved to win, I think, than if it's every fish counts. Now, you could say it's only five pounders and above that counts. I don't care. Mm-hmm. But my point is, I feel like there is more luck involved in a five fish tournament to actually win versus every fish counts. Because at that point, you can get on a good pattern and mm-hmm. run the pattern. Mm-hmm. 
you got to be at the right place at the right time. And Brandon Polnick said this amazingly when he won at Lake Champlain. There is no luck in catching fish. The luck is when you drop your bait down there, the five pounder eats it and the two pounder doesn't eat it if they're mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. I think that's really interesting because more and more people are, are they, I mean, this is the biggest fight between MLF and bass is, is five versus everything counts. And I wonder if it was just an age gap thing where it's like the people that grew up with it mm -hmm. being this way, it's like, well, it only has to be this way. I don't know. Um, I will say though, I'm not watching as much of either one anymore. And mm -hmm. I think, I don't know why. I don't know if it's because because of social media, YouTube. You know, we don't have as much time to sit and watch eight hours mm -hmm. straight versus I'd rather get the clips mm -hmm. of everything. I don't know if I don't know. It's just interesting to get your thoughts on that. And I want to get more and more people's thoughts in the comment section. And just in general, do you like best five? Do you like every fish counts? Or do you like to watch both? I used to like to watch both. And and the thing, like you bring an interesting point too of the viewer. What is it like for the viewer? Mm -hmm. And it is that MLF style, the way they set that up is is easier or you know, a little bit easier to watch. But oh, Lonnie, um, that's a good point. Lonnie. Hey, what's up, Lonnie? Best five MLF style. Now I will say this. I think the catchway mm. release is the way of the future because the Texas tournament, when they always had on like Lake Fork, that lake is catchway release for mm -hmm. the bigger ones. Right. I think the catchway release will be here forever. It'll right. be perfect because there's so many lakes where because of slot limits and stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, you cannot tell me that if you catch a 10 pounder and immediately release it, that's not better for it than if you throw it in a live well and it drives around the lake for eight hours. Like right. That's I don't know, but I think it comes down to money yeah. and the fact that weigh-ins probably generate some kind of revenue. Yeah, and I think, and uh, again, go back to the classic. You know, went to the classic last year, it was the first time, but they it's, it's still a show. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they, when Ray Scott, when they, when he set that up, like, uh, it's it's showmanship. Um, but they're they, I like the way they do. They they invite you into the show. I think mm -hmm. and that's what I love about it because you can you can participate in view for everything from the launch to the expo uh to the to the way in and it's a show i mean it's it's but and at the same time what i love too though they are bringing somebody out of the college you have opportunity to if, if you're good enough you'll make it gerald oh, yeah, swindle yeah, yeah. same thing he was swinging a hammer he was swinging a hammer you know a carpenter working construction breaking his back was winning was winning some potluck tournaments here mm -hmm. and there and got a break you know so I mean, everybody has that opportunity. Will everybody make it? No, you're not. But. No, no. And I think it's just evolving. I think this is an issue. I'll go back to baseball. Baseball has done a horrific job adjusting and adapting. Like, I'm sorry. I don't like the time limit crap they're doing with pitchers mm -hmm. now. It's mm -hmm. just weird. It's almost mm -hmm. like an 80-year-old trying to be hip and get into TikTok slang. It just right. it's, it feels so weird. But you know why? They, that, that's interesting. Though. The way, reason they did that wasn't for the baseball players so much as the viewers because yeah. as it drags out. Our attention span, I think, is getting less and less. But and, what if they cut it down instead of nine innings, you just do seven? Yeah. Would that be better? I don't know. Like, I mean, I could talk to you about all that because I think yeah. that's interesting where it's like, but that's the same thing I see with fishing where it's like bass versus MLF. MLF is the new kid on the block that tried something different. Right. And then everyone's like, oh, this is not fishing. It's like, well, no, it's not. It's not your style. It's right. like softball, slow pitch softball versus baseball. Right. I don't know. That's kind of my, I, my vibe. I'm always the positive saying that basically there's enough in the market. The, the market can bear it as a whole. Oh, yeah. The fishing industry, it's okay to have two or three different styles. I yeah. mean, they can bring more in. Like you're seeing more and more saltwater too now, mm -hmm. televised, you know, where they're going out and, and doing that. Well, that's so just really cool. That's, yeah, that's a whole nother animal idea of competition i mean it's still com it's competitive mm -hmm. and it's but what they're doing for us is it's how they're bringing it into our living room yes right and so or like you're saying you're a lot you're streaming it on your phone or your mm -hmm. computer at work i mean that's that to me and that's what i think they understand in the business world that we need to bring it to every mm -hmm. everyday person yeah, and i agree and guys again please if you could like this uh if you could like Drop a like on this thing. It really helps the algorithm push us. Again, I'm going to give away a door prize at the end for all questions or just comments asked with the super chat function. So go onto the YouTube, use the super chat function. At the end, I'm going to take all those. I'm going to raffle away a, a gift card and a couple of baits that I brought with me. So again, that's on YouTube. If you want to come by, Jake's, and you just want to get on the show, you're more than welcome to. Um, before we, we pivot, and we're going to get to like all the questions. We had 16 people at one point were up to 12 now viewing and we have a ton of questions we got to get to um the last thing i'm gonna put a pin on this and i i, I got this in the last live stream i did specifically about this i'm not a hundred percent like an mlf fanboy here 
I talked a lot of trash about them the last time for their decisions they're making here. But my point is they've had some really good ideas I don't think people think about. Number one, there was a kid that died at an Okeechobee event. It was a Costa series. And I was actually there fishing just for fun the same time that that kid passed away because they forced them to go out in bad weather conditions. MLF style, you're allowed to trailer to whatever ramp you want if the weather's bad. Brilliant. Bass doesn't do that. The other thing is they don't have a way in. So if there's a weather delay, they just stop and then they'll pick up the tournament later that day, depending if the weather gets out of there in time, because they don't have a way in to deal with. So they'll mm -hmm. go a little bit later. That's absolutely brilliant. Like there are little things that I think that they were smart that Bass had the opportunity to be like, oh, this is an idea that we mm -hmm. should probably implement. It makes sense. Right. Number three. And I, I, I'm sorry. I really love this. You know what's going on. If I'm a competitor, this is the only sport where you have no idea what anyone else is doing. Mm. And I like the pressure that mm -hmm. they're forced to hear. By the way, right. you're down by 10 pounds. What right. are you going to do? That's right. Yep. Why doesn't Bass do that? And that was like, it's such a brilliant thing because you can then see the strategy involved of if you're flipping pads and then you're down by 20 pounds, are you going to commit to it or are you not? You know, I don't and know. No, and that's, and, and again, when you, I hate to keep going back to it, but when you go, to the classic what you realize see i always hated the fact too if you're live streaming it well they cut that thing off and it's like gosh and they leave you hanging but why is it well because you've got literally tens of thousands of people sitting in an arena and as they bring the boats in and around it's that suspense mm -hmm. and we're going to put them in the hot seat and who does he have enough weight so like they're gonna see like you said before tease you in to, you're watching and you're seeing where it's kind of like a, what i don't care if it's a horse race or whatever yeah. like they're coming around they're coming down to, to a wire and then all of a sudden you 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 blank it out because we want to you know see at the end end who wins it's that suspense i like that um, and cut it but i still think you need to know if no i agree with that too if, yes if you are if you're back by two pounds like, yes to be able to know that as a competitor like okay i'm gonna adjust my strategy i here. think that's yeah that's definitely i like that the, the strategy aspect of it, and that's what mlf did so good when then the people would talk like okay should i keep doing this mm -hmm. i gotta make an adjustment because we're close mm -hmm. but then also hearing them all talk and this was also in the show where like the whole lake shuts off at the same mm -hmm. time and then you hear them talk about that because mm -hmm. like well no one's caught a fish in about 20 minutes mm -hmm. the lake must be in a bad lull I'm going to make a run or make right. an adjustment or, oh, Polonik's catching him. Well, clearly he's a deep water guy. Therefore, it's yes. a deep fight. Like, yes. that was so freaking cool. Well, Bass does that, too, though, like with their maps. That's what I love, oh, their too. Maps, their yeah. maps, and they're going to pull up and show you where they're where they are. And to your point, like that, are they catching them shallow? Are they catching them deep? What and is is it one pattern that's going to win it or is mm -hmm. it multiple or that? And again, it goes, that, goes back to the decisions that we all run into of like, do I leave and go? Do I move? Do I stay? Do I? especially in a title anytime but anyway you know it is it's a fascinating it, now you i don't know if you heard this but they're doing a team tournament format now, really which was interesting uh, for mlf uh, hmm. they experimented with it they're going to do it next year where you basically each person has their own boat but they have to be mic'd up mm. and then you not only get to see the video but you get to hear the conversation between them and their partner that's cool um oh, I that's have, cool i like that i have no idea and i'll leave it with this before we get to some of these questions guys because we got a ton i have no idea why there's no team tournament big league style because oh, i like that how many of us just fish team tournaments like that's it why is there not a market for that and you will know what thomas too you can almost do it like your baseball and then do yes. your single but then go ahead and have an all-star wouldn't be an all would be an all-star or like a oh, uh, or cool. like a yeah an all-star game an all -star nfl tournament. does too like you know so yeah. go ahead and take you know and i don't know how you would do it but that would be really awesome to put two pros on a boat fishing against others do a bracket tournament i don't know yeah, whatever cool. that would be a really awesome the conversation the be, rivalry yeah because a lot of your other tournaments are set up as a team which is totally different but but that's a whole different uh but that would definitely their strategy isn't there like, oh I mean, my gosh I that mean, would definitely uh there that would you might be on something there let's see we got teams would be cool that would be very cool we got we got Connor back on here. I think MLF is a great also because the average angler can actually watch them work different yes, style baits yes. and what they are using, where they are using it. Yeah, I like. Yeah, you're right, Lonnie. No, 100 percent there. And the fact is, you got to keep fishing. Um, again, I keep going back to that. So you can have a great day. And I had a tournament where I smoked them. I caught like 20 fish, and I had about 15 pounds in the boat. They're all about three pounds, and I finished in the top like 30 because i didn't like catch the biggest ones mm -hmm. but going back on that day i'm like that was still a fun day i did really well i i caught them all day they were solid but there was mm -hmm. no i didn't catch that kicker where this, right. the guy that won it he sat on one spot and he only had five bites mm -hmm. does that mean he's a better angler even though i went out there and i caught 20 15 pounds all day just just killing it right. I, I don't know it's just a different right. if it's a different style 
uh let's see scott fishing if you went with every scoreable fish format and have big bass why not also have best five pot winners for dual format for entertainment purposes if that's the goal with catch way release formats i mean i'm not against that i i just think it's weird that you punish guys let me rephrase that the guys that complain about the mlf format on the big stage are guys that aren't good at it. Jacob Wheeler, who owns it, Edwin Evers, Octafo, who are good at it, they're not complaining. It's the guys that did it and then left and went back to bass. Right. I, and I think that's what's issue my issue is it's not guys that are that have had success that are like, I don't like the every fish counts format. It's the only the guys that couldn't cut it. And that's right. where it's like a little weird to me. If if Jacob Wheeler is the one that came out officially before and said, like, hey, listen, even though I'm like the best at this format. I don't think it's best for sport. Okay, cool. But it's guys that have never had success with it. They're like, oh, I don't like this format. It's like, okay, because you're not good at it. Right. The other thing I think is that's different is Bass has a different information role. So like a Scott Martin wouldn't do well at mm. MLF because he has like a house full of guys that he communicates with. Right. Whereas MLF is like, you're not allowed to talk to anybody. Mm. I don't know, guys. I get back to Okay. What was what, a long time ago? Electronics is way more expensive now. A hundred percent. I think that's stupid that boats now have. Mm. I looked at Brad and Polynix boat guys. He's running six lithium batteries right now. At some point, you're going to have a Tesla in the back of these boats. Mm -hmm. Like that's, it's going to be freaking insane. Um, Let's see. Kayak tournament length, yeah. length live release. Better for fish with some. Yeah. That's I think, true too. Yeah. Well, you're going to five, five longest, five longest, five heaviest. So it's still kind of in. Yeah. But again, like that's the thing is like the app there is happening. The catch yeah, that is a cool. Kayaking. Again, I I just I think I love the fact that it has something for everyone. Like mm -hmm. depending the back to what you're saying, based on your style, what you like, what your preference is, uh, in competition, we're all wired to be competitive. Aluni again, it's because of inflation, and it will eventually mm. price itself out of existence, or they cut stop the price of inflation to attract more anglers. Mm. Yeah, I believe that because again, if it keeps going up, what's going to end up happening is you're just not going to want to fish the bass opens because it's just too expensive. Right? right. No, and that is true. Some people won't, but they're still getting people. And that's my thing, too. I don't know if price, why? Because people are still, who would have thought anybody's going to go out and buy an $80,000 bass boat? Right? Oh, yeah, 100%. But people are spending it. So there's our boy Travis. Travis, Thomas, what's going on? Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy holidays. But if you want to come on by me on the show, I'll be here for a while. Would you include 360? I'm talking Matthew. I think you're uh, talking about 360 sonar. Yeah, 100. percent Like I won, I won the ABA. I won the six grand for that event, and it was because of 360 on the Potomac River. Mm. I was able to line up my cast on the grass bed perfectly. Mm. Um, again, I'm just saying, like a technology that's super expensive, and maybe that's what we're talking about is just a price cap. Like for example, in NASCAR nowadays, I think there's a there's a cap on what you can do to your car. Mm -hmm. Didn't they used to do that in the Bassmaster Classic too, where everyone had the same? Boat? Yeah, like I say, they the very first ones. I read an article. Very first ones, they literally would put the the participants on an airplane. You didn't know the you didn't even know the body of water you were fishing. That is actually pretty cool. And then when you landed, they provided the bass boats. You all had the same equal horsepower, same same exact boat. And then mm -hmm. they what was thought was interesting too. They weighed they weighed your tackle box. You're kidding. So you could only take so much tackle. Yeah, that had to be equal too, right? So that was the beginning. So then they started. You know, now I, it, to back to your point, you cannot deny the fact that this is a business. This industry is, is as much as we want to go out there and catch fish and whatever they're, this side of it is a business. It's mm -hmm. about making money and, and they're doing it. I mean, it's, it's, we're spending it. We're spending that money. All of us are. No, no, we are different levels. I mean, I've been going out and bought an $80,000 bass boat, but I've spent my fair share of Let's see, big bluegill out of Passage Creek is nothing like the big bluegills in Lake Frederick. Lake Frederick still has hmm. some big bluegills. I think that's when, uh, Scott, that's a question when we're talking about, like, what do you consider a big fish is? And, hmm. yeah, I think it's all subject to where you're at, too. Like, hmm. a smallmouth, if I catch a smallmouth over three and a half, four pounds out of the Shenandoah, mm -hmm. that's pretty good quality. And, that's honestly, right. this, like, and, guys, we're going to do one more stream this year, pro hopefully here, but it's just going to talk about our goals for 2023. One of my goals is actually to get a certified um, citation. Uh, hmm. We had one guest on here. Uh, that talked about like every fish that he got certified. So mm -hmm. we have this cool room with all this right. the certs. That's cool. Which I think is important that even if you, if you want to truly brag about your fish, always have a scale, always mm -hmm. have a measuring tape. And if it is really big, you can get it certified. Right. Whether it's a 10 pounder or not, or whether it's a big bluegill mm -hmm. or not. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Again, guys, please like, 
like the channel. It really helps in the algorithm. If you guys want to come on by Jake's Bait and Tackle, I'll be here for a while, uh, live streaming, talking, fishing here on Christmas Eve. My wife's working until 9 o'clock tonight. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not going to be here that long. But if you guys want to come on by. And again, if you want to comment with the Super Chat feature or ask a question, um, all that goes is to helping upgrading the, our equipment. We are announcement we're going to the richmond expo um in some capacity i'm nice. not gonna give too much away but uh jared and i will be yeah. there um doing that so come on by the richmond Expo. do more on that uh as we go and then let us see we got some more questions here scott for five dollars no question just wanted to support the channel merry christmas Thanks, to scott. all of your families thank you so much scott right now is in the running for the raffle let's see i think i answered that question let's see there's too many people that there are uh, Matthew. Oh my God, Matthew Weimer. Um, there is too many people that think they are pros and think they need to be in tournaments. Yeah, it spreads it spreads its out winnings. Hmm. I do agree that I do have an issue when you get pros that cherry pick tournaments. The mm. only reason is it's like if if a pro baseball player went back to college to just play, and you'd be like, well, don't they go down to triple A? Yeah, triple A, but not double A, single A. Mm -hmm. At what level should the pros not be allowed because it's not going to help with the growth of the younger athletes? And like BFL-ish level or lower, I think that's kind of weird. Now, if you want to hop in, Jacob Wheeler is famous for this. He hopped in a tournament and he won it, but then he donated his winnings to the person down below him. Mm, that's cool. That was really, okay, cool. I like yeah. that. So if you still want to compete, that's one thing. But I do think it's weird where you might be taking money away from like a Jeremy Radford who like, if he won that tournament, it would mean more to him and his career than maybe a, I don't know, a Scott Martin or someone like that. Uh, let's see, guys. I'm trying to get all through. The, oh, I already answered that question. It's because of inflation. There are too many people that they are pros. Uh, oh, here we go. Money plays a part. If a kid can't afford 20 rods, a boat, $100,000 in electronics, and they compete against Scott Martin's daughter with all. Oh, God, that's a hot topic. So you, you're so up I on that. still no, I still no, I don't know what's the story on that. Oh no, like so, she's fishing the Bassmaster High School oh, stuff, okay. and Scott Martin is her boat captain. Well, you had um, so I don't yeah. know. It, I she still yeah, Ike and Ellie, him, Ike and Ellie's son fished and against some of our youth too yeah. down there. So you're right, you still have to catch him. I I don't uh, the optics are bad. I, I, get I that. just I don't know. I have a hard time. I've said before. I've had customers take their six year old out and catch a six yeah. pounder with a you know Paw Patrol Snoopy pole. So um, yeah. Now optics though, like that to me is like I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But if I <clears> was the parent in that situation, my thought was I would take like so Ike didn't personally. I know this. I know Ike. I don't think personally guided his son um at the he high did. school event did he, he? Did, yeah. all days okay yeah. so well with scott he did and i think there's optics there where it's going to make it look like who helped the kid out all right so here's and <laughs> competitively speaking back this even applies to what you're talking about before like if, if the big guns come in like i want to compete against them why and he might wax me but i'm gonna learn potentially where he's fishing i'm gonna learn more i'm gonna become a better angler and yeah, I get there's different levels, but I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on winning. Like we're all out to win. My point being is that it's equal opportunity. And the thing about I love about fishing and being involved with the youth, I've seen kids come in with uh, you know little or no equipment and actually go out and have success and be good. So I don't it this money, this technology, these rods, this it doesn't always equate. equate. I just think somebody that knows has the right mind understands fish knows how to catch them mm -hmm. whether you i just i don't know I, I disagree with that i think it's you might have a slight advantage but when it comes to fishing though you're on the same body of water what about a cap like 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 in nfl you have a salary cap so like um if fishing installed a rule that you can't spend more than a hundred thousand dollars on your boat or whatever i want to say like, like this i've seen guys like just on even a local level river i've seen guys put the john boat guy right that's yeah. i mean and granted now again we don't i don't have a lot of tournament experience but i remember <laughs> another quick story steve and i put in it was a jet boat shootout on the shenandoah and you got tons of these guys with these big river boats you know jet boats mm -hmm. we put in at route 50 in a canoe okay and float down with a little trolling motor we didn't win it but we did win big fish we had over a four pounder that we weighed in and so we were outclassed right when you talk about if you put money on what our outfit and we bought a cooler from walmart and put an aerator in it mm -hmm. i mean that's what i'm talking about so 
Now I'm not saying we're I'm not we're not as good as those guys, but we competed in an equal playing field on the river, and we end up with big fish. And they, and, they, and the guys even said, I remember it weighing, oh, those are the guys in the canoe, those guys in the canoe. So it's like, so does what, it? So it's a John boat guy. What I'm saying, the John boat guy with experience that knows mm -hmm. can go out and beat the guy. Oh, 100 in the fifty thousand dollar no rig. No, he can, but but then again, I, and it comes down to two things. I think it's optics. Number one, right. Optics are big. N n like, so if I was a big time pro, I wouldn't want to fish a local club derby because of the optics of that. Right. It's not going to look good. It's it's, it's going to only hurt my brand. Number number. Unless you can go out and beat that guy too. That's what I'm well, saying. They, if, they if could you're beat any me, type of competitor, but I can. I want it. a piece of that, and you might knock me out. You might beat me, but I want to. I want to take my. I oh, take I, my legs. A hundred percent. Like in, in fishing, like I mean, you can see me so many times when, when local pros jackpot tournaments yeah. and they lose. But but I, it's not about whether you can beat him or not. It's about he can financially afford it. So example is if I'm a pro that's made it financially and I have my LLC set up, that's a tax write-off mm. or I have somebody paying my fee. I win that tournament. Yeah, that it's whatever for me, but I'm taking it away from a guy that had my had to have saved up his money. And that one slot he might've needed to be able to pay his stuff because mm -hmm. he's up and coming. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean is, is there's gotta be a cutoff. And I think not the coasters or the bass opens, but let's just say if you're a BFL guy and I came in second place and that four grand would have been huge for me because mm -hmm. it's a tournament win. It's mm -hmm. hard for me. And then I have Scott Martin that just beat me. Mm -hmm. That does not that BFL win does nothing for Scott Martin. Right. For Jeremy Radford, that BFL right. win might have been huge for right. his little sponsors and stuff like that. That is to me, it's where it's like in college, which is nice in a vacuum, when you're fishing college or high school, you're still fishing against your peers. It, it's everyone that's in your peer bracket. Right. Some have more financial backing than others, fine, but it's still your peers. Once you get out of high school, college, all of a sudden you could be fishing a club where you're fishing against a 30 year pro or a guy that's just starting out too. And right. I think that's where they need that next level of like of, of that system to groom talent to where it's like after college, what are you supposed to do? Go straight up against Michael Iaconelli and mm -hmm. all the pros, mm -hmm. or should they create an area? Like you can't be a pro guide or professional angler, but this is just for like guys that want to experience that next level of competition. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't know the right answer to it, but I, I do think there something has to be done to help groom the next generation of talent. That's not going from BFL to, now you have to do the bass open and travel all night. There has to be that in-between gap to help groom at some point because I think there's a need for it now. But let's – good mm. Lord. Um, yeah, we got a blow up here. But I, I think a lot of people – guys, who do you who do you agree with here? Because I think Jared is going to probably have a lot of people agreeing with him right now. Uh, let's see. Epic would be a popular co-angle. Oh, yeah. Yep, they had that once. Uh, the fish off on the Outdoor Channel where you had a, a co-angler versus mm. the boater um we got looney again uh you are correct if you look at the guys that left they either couldn't cut it or mm -hmm. complain because yeah back to the mlf question mm -hmm. yeah i think that's interesting again it doesn't it's american versus national league some guys play right. better in one versus the other brandon that's pronick right. is still a fantastic angler even though the mlf wasn't his format he's right. still really good that's right i do think it talks more highly of now i think jacob wheeler should be considered one of the best anglers ever because he literally can win on either format. Right. I mean, that's insane that he transitions so well back and forth between both, and he dominates. Right. Um, let's see. Roger Merritt. Ever see lithium blow up? Wait until they start happening. I, I keep, oh, God, who was it who we had on? Was it, um, oh, Susquehanna. Oh, crap. He was on the River Guy panel. Horses. Thank you. Yeah. He doesn't run lithium. I remember looking at his old thing. He's yeah. still nervous about it. Yeah. He was talking about the engineering and just, yeah, being so new and just not sure Expensive. where you get them from. Like, so how they're, I guess maybe how they're manufactured or how they're built. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They're expensive though. Like, I mean, I was looking at them because of the weight cost, but dude, good Lord. Yeah. A thousand bucks per battery. Like that's, that's yeah. a lot. And anything of money. new has got to, they got to work the kinks out of it, but yeah, like it's going to take time. Even if you can't afford it, let's see what we got here. Um, let's see, drag, uh, let's see, dragging spawning bass around. And yeah, yeah, I agree with that. All the time seems like money over conservation ethics. I agree with that. I think you should, uh, I agree, Casey, I, I think protecting the fishery, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I think that's strong. And I, and I like back what you're talking about during that spawn time of year, go to to your point thomas catch if you're going to do a catch wave release and uh it, it, it's just there's so many they can cool... swim right back down to their bed and they can protect those eggs especially on big bodies of water like <clears> I, <throat> I heard about i think was it um odin Kirk we talked about we barely mentioned it with the um with lake champlain they did research about 
you're transporting fish mm-hmm. from let's say like, like Conowingo all the way back up north, these massive distances, mm-hmm. places like that, especially that's where I think catchway release would be beneficial. Right. Even the Potomac River, where if you have fish at you know Nanjamoin or, or Potomac Creek and you're bringing mm-hmm. them up to Mattawoman, mm-hmm. Lake Frederick, if you do a, a, a regular <clears throat> wild, a live well tournament. It's not that big of a distance, but these tournaments where you have these massive areas, it's it's got to be better for them. And I guess Bass is doing that in certain things. You watch, yeah. there's certain, and I don't know if that's because of the, the county state regulations there or not. I don't know why. I've never heard why they do it, but I've, some of the ones I'm watching, they mm-hmm. make that, that that's well, necessary. And I think it was interesting listening to some guides is like the reason the call tag change was there. Mm-hmm. It wasn't for the pros. It mm-hmm. was the idea of trying to start the trend because it's the, it's the everyday anglers mm-hmm. that have the weekend tournaments. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be an interesting thing, too. Is the problem the big tournaments, or is it you have a tournament every single weekend, local ones, Mm -hmm. that are moving fish, that are moving fish? Mm -hmm. Is that where we need to look at the catchway release? Mm -hmm. Because if bass comes there once a year, is that affecting it? Or is it a Lake Gunnersville where you have a local jackpot every night, and you're habitually moving fish constantly? Is that the issue? I don't know. I don't yeah, know. and then I get, I mean, I say that, but then I get back to, not, there's no doubt in my mind, I think Casey's right on on that, but at the same time, I think, you know, it depends on your populations. Um, obviously, you're not in the business for killing fish. I think we've come a long way with fish care, and uh, So, guys, for the people that are listening, no way random kids without money have close to the rods, baits, boats, electronics, Scott. Okay, so Here's the thing. I I did baseball training for over 17 years. Guess what? There are some families that they they have the ability to help the kids out more. Mm-hmm. If you played college ball, you can instill more stuff. That's not I don't think that's the issue. I'm just saying optically, if I was in that position, I wouldn't I would I would be in the boat for practice, but the tournament wise, I wouldn't want to be the captain just because I don't want them to think that of my kid. Like clearly the reason he did well is because of you. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing when like my dad coached me. At one point he stopped and had somebody else coach yeah. me. That way there's not that conflict of interest. That's, That's all right. I mean is no, you're right. If about I that. was there, I wouldn't be in the boat You wouldn't want to put the kid in that sit. You're right. No, that's a good point, Thomas. Yeah. Because again, yeah, if you're a pro at anything, you're gonna help your kid out. Like right. I, don't, I don't care if it's if it's football, baseball, whatever like yeah see, like, and i still just i, I go back to because we've all seen in athletics we've, mm-hmm. we've had our butts handed to us and then so two things you're going to do you're either going to get better i mean yeah, i don't know i don't know yeah i agree i agree no uh it yeah it's weird it just again yeah i don't know it's a gray area there scott again issue is the tourneys are not really two or three days but actually seven to ten yeah, you consider that that's the true. majors are coming and free fishing the fishery true. and that's interesting too if you are fishing an open up until next year like you could pre-fish a month in that fishery mm-hmm. and i think that's what we don't understand and i think i want to get either odenkirk on the show next year in 2023 and talk about this but bass is not going to the james river mm-hmm. and the rumor is that it's because the dnr said we don't want you back this year mm-hmm. we want to we want the river to have a breather which is smart because i was just thinking about that between that and the chick i think that's a wise rotate that rotate it to give it a, a break because you when i went there this year uh, with you guys in the mm. spring, there was like what seven mm. tournaments going out that weekend. It yeah. was insane yeah. the boat traffic. And you're right, and he's right too. The the pre fishing, and then yeah, week after week after week. So uh, and it could it could take its toll on him. I mean, over time. So I think that is wise. Mm-hmm. You've talked about this too of moving it, moving it around, and it's yeah, it's like Hartwell. But I do <clears throat> I realize too. I mean, yeah, I, I believe in moving it around just a little bit because it's like <clears throat> I think the one thing that MLF did that was so much fun was the fact that you went to new places, right. especially when it was the TV show and you'd go like you blinded folded all the pros mm-hmm. and you just dumped them on a place, mm-hmm. figured out. And because it was a smaller field, you could do that. Oh, that mm-hmm. was fun. There was like the Carolina lakes. I think the first year MLF happened, the, mm-hmm. the BPT, it was in North Carolina, but it was like three or four lakes, uh, really small. And they were really good. Mm-hmm. I literally never heard of those lakes until they mm-hmm. went there. Right. I do believe that it does. Again, I think the St. Lawrence River is a lot of fun, but you're going there like ten years in a row. Mm-hmm. It, it does get a little boring. I could, I don't know. It's just it would be neat to go to different places, right? Uh, I don't know. That, that those are that's my. I know the too. cities are probably throwing in a lot too. Like they take yep. care of them. They got a, the arena. They got different things. But the, but you, there's still other places you can go. You can rotate that around. Now, Matthew, so what we're talking about is the Bass Opens have been going to the James River <clears throat> for a good portion of the last 10, 20 years. They've been going there. 
And it gets to the point that back when it was just, you only had to fish three tournaments, which should be like, let's say the Eastern Swing. If you lived on the James and you did well in that tournament, all you'd have to do is decent at two other events and you could make the open field in theory. And so if you always go to the same three lakes back in the old system, you could make the open, you could go through the opens and qualify. If you were good at the Champlain and the James River, you pretty much guaranteed a slot or in the top four or five. This year, they're not going back. They're actually going to Kerr, um, which is Bugs Island, I think, which mm-hmm. is above uh, Lake Gaston, which yep. is pretty cool. So they're give, they're giving it a break this year, which is probably probably for the best. We're gonna do baits, and then we'll mm-hmm. kind of like a unless there's something else, we'll kind of finish up here. So guys, here's the here's the one that I have, uh, blade baits. This is the Demiki Volt. Um, you can get this at Jake's Bait and Tackle as well. They have them in stock here. Uh, there's two versions. You got the Jackal right here, which has a blade, which gives a little bit more flash than the Demiki. I like silver or anything with like a little bit of flash and, and hue to it right here. Um, the way I like to throw this is I like to throw it on braided spinning reels with like 20 to 30 pound braid. The reason is you can immediately open the bale and it'll drop straight back down, which I think is very important because a lot of times when I pull this thing up, and I think this was when I was fishing with Jeff Green, I had a small mouth followed up and I popped the bale and it went straight back down and, and he ate it, which is kind of nice. The other thing I like to do with this guys is I like to get soft treble hooks. The point is, if it gets snagged and I have 30 pound braid, I can break the treble hook or bend it out. So I get the bait back, which I think is really important because these things do snag, but they catch fish. They just flat out catch fish. And then what you can go with is like a dual realis. Uh, this is a one knock or a silent, um, which gives it just a different thud and different profile. But that's like one bait I like to fish this time of year. Um, what do you got? That's a good call on that. And those sort of buddies are popular too. Ooh, uh, too. But same type of thing, blade bait. <laughs> I'm a big uh, Ned Rig guy. Um, favorite color is the green pumpkin goby. I know it doesn't seem like much, <clears throat> but in this always, I know you always talk about Ned Rig versus tube. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this guy right here fished on the bottom with a Ned Rig hook. Uh, just, and you can see as I'm holding it there, it just, it, it's going to dance around. It's 2.75 inches dragging along in the bottom or popping it. There's no wrong way to fish it. Uh, but it's, I think it's, it's good any time of year, but a cold water, uh, you know, morsel, small morsel. Um, just had a lot of success on that. I don't know that I'm a kind of guy too, that I think, you know, Z man, that Z man, green pumpkin goby is my go-to, but I like trying to experiment, you know, missiles, um, Ned bomb. Also what I like about it, theirs is that tail right there. Uh, same body, uh, that tail though is, I think, and you can Dude, swim nice. it. That's awesome. I mean, I think, you <laughs> I know, again, cold that. water, that, that little bit of action might entice them. Um, I've had luck with these. Uh, actually, i got a young man, too, that catches, uh, uses them for trout, believe it or not, out there at Wilkins Lake. He's caught some trout in Clearbrook late on this little dude. I do want to try, you know, Scott Barrett's uh, Nico. You know, he was on the podcast. I want to try his right. Ned Rig, too. I've got it. I have it. You know, what's funny about human nature, too, is I think we kind of we have our confidence baits that we really like that we really are confident in. Yeah, I don't throw those other baits as much because I know that this catches now this may catch equal or his may catch equal if you threw it the same amount of time. Yeah. And that's where I'm I challenge myself sometimes to find out, is it a color? Is it a certain bait or style or is it just me? Is it anything 2.75 inches going to catch fish? But anyway, Ned Rig cold water again any time of year but i usually have that tied on i do like to go braid to fluoro leader okay um on that so spinning gear um, right spinning gear yep so that's chris gorsuch point was interesting during the again guys because i get to edit this i get to like watch it a couple of times and mm-hmm. and his thing about confidence and it was so crazy yeah, that there was yeah. a there was a spike in like the so again on, on the youtube studio size it shows you the algorithm or when people dropped off or spiked the thing just went insanely up when Chris Gorsuch talked about just having confidence. And I think it's so interesting because what you brought back, how much of these baits are, it's like, oh, this is our confidence. Mm-hmm. Color. Like, it, does a fish care if it's like right. purple or there's a little right. bit of black flake right. or is it, is is it, it us? We're just, mm-hmm. we're fishing it longer. Um, yeah. Ned Rig, guys. Uh, yeah, he beat me to it. I'm going to go with Ned Rig too. Again, this is the power neg- Ned Rig system. Mm. This is, I always remember, it's the Boss Mini Head Jig. And it's just basically, it's a its a light wire jig head. But what's nice is I can fish this on 14, 12 pound fluorocarbon. And I can actually stick them pretty hard. And then what you can tell is, guys, this is like a super light wire jig head that I have on there. 
and you can just be able to set the hook a little bit harder and be able to boat flip them, which is super duper nice. Um, and then since mine was a little bit fast, I have another bait that I want to talk about, which is where is it? Oh. It is right here. Little swim bait. This is a little swim bait number one. I put it on a ball head. Again, swim bait time of year here. The key with a bait like this is again, you're just gonna just slow roll this thing. I like a a 2.5 to a 2.8 Kitech, something around there. Um, it's a fantastic little bait, especially with you're dealing with like jerk bait fish that just get constantly pressured by jerk baits. Going with a little swim bait is a really fantastic deal this time of year as well. Small mouth, large mouth doesn't matter. They'll, they'll tag a swim bait. That's interesting because uh, what did you go with? Same thing, swim bait. Uh, the little dipper, and again, Kitech is is probably has the market on swim baits. Uh, but what I like about this one, um, oh, he's got a hook too. It's it's a little more durable, I think, the plastic. Um, and and I, I sold one of these to a guy the other day because what I like about something like this too is is you can throw it as a trailer on a spinner bait on a jackhammer, but you can also throw it alone. Mm -hmm. And you know, anything with that boot tail, um, <clears throat> you know, I've had big smallmouth uh eat this. Um fish it the cool thing about this too is you can fish it in all levels of the water column you can fish it slow on the bottom nose down tail up and i think fish swim along and they see that they're going to pick that up mm -hmm. you can slow roll it and then you can you can speed it up you know you can fish again literally all levels of water column the hook and these are hard to find we do sell some of these jeff little actually kind of i think mark marketed this or or had the corner on this this style head right here there's the weight on the bottom and then you have a screw lock will go in the head and you got a good wide gap here okay so it's going to be weedless and what i love about this is the way that weight is it when i said before it allows that swim bait if you want to fish drag it along the bottom it's going to have weighted nose down and it's going to leave the tail up uh, as if this fish is bait fish is feeding on the bottom bigger fish going to come by and eat it but you can also still swim this uh, it's weedless. You can swim it. Um, so that head, again, we do have them here. Um, and plus, if you're a river guy, last thing on this river guy, this narrow uh, weight right here, you can, uh, in the river, if it gets lodged between a rock, if you get up to it, it'll pop right off. These are a little more expensive than your regular hooks, but I think you don't lose as many. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I think that's so important <clears throat> That's the one thing I've always was was complaining about too, guys. Is when you fish the Ned Rig, the old mushroom head on the river, it's you're asking to get it snagged and mm. finding that perfect head. And this hook right here is just so freaking awesome. And I like, I really do like the screw lock just for to keep that thing mm. completely snug. Um, that's the one problem with whether Nico has the same kind of elastic stuff, so whether it's Z Man right. or Elastec, this stuff does not want to stay right. on a hook if you don't super glue it or have something like, like that. And I gotta say, real quick, too, you know, everything, um, you know, you have like fish slow, fish slow, cold water fish slow. Uh, but again, you've heard me say before, like, you also got to see what how the fish want it. Mm -hmm. And that one particular, uh, real nice, almost a little shy five pound smallmouth. I was fishing really slow, not getting anything. As I got close to the bank, I started speeding it up, a little more kicking action, and that smallmouth came out and started chasing. I thought, hmm. So I went out and went a faster rate, speed, um, and it actually took it. And so, hmm. and then that takes me to the last article I just wrote. You know, there this idea of fishing deep winter holes. Yes, that is true, but it also you need to fish shallow as well. Um, you know, Great chatterbait trailer. Yep, yep. paddle tails, one hundred percent. We need, we need, uh, we, uh, reach out to us because I want to have you back on the show again. Uh, that was a really fun interview, and I'd love to pick your brain again, dude. Um, oh, my turn. You guys were asking for it last time, um, and I'm finally doing it. I'm going to give away my big secret for the winter time, mm, and it's a okay. swim bait. Uh, you guys, this is a California company. It's really hard to get these in because what they did is they actually used a mold of a dead fish for these things. So. I talked about this a little bit with the um, with Mega Bass, with Mega Bass and other companies. If you hold a bait like this, you can tell how rigid it is. The problem in the winter time is as the water gets colder, plastic gets a lot stiffer, and you want something that's super duper soft to have that action. The American Trash Fish. Look at how much bend that has, mm. and then you can actually feel that. Interesting. 
it's insanely soft plastic, insanely soft. And it also has all these little appendages on it. The key with this bait is it's not a swim bait in the sense where you reel it. If you do, it's not going to work. It's, it's a bottom crawling bait. Hmm. That's what it's made for. And so what I do with this, when I catch all my big fish in the wintertime, right. you put it on, you put it either on a ball head bait, a ball head jig like this. If you, if you are in open water, like rocks and stuff, or what I like to do instead of a beast owner hook is you put it on a swing head, you put it on a swing head, get a three eighths ounce, which is perfectly fine. You could go up to a hat or go down to a half that works too. You want it heavy enough to basically stay on the bottom. And all you're doing is you're barely crawling this thing on the bottom. And as you can tell with this thing, if I hit the nose, you see how it pulses, everything quivers on it. So what I want you to imagine with this thing is you're crawling it on the bottom. And this thing is just slowly going here, rooting on around the bottom. And you have a big bass sharking it. And what happens every time you hit something, this thing's going to quiver and it's going to move. And he's just going to suck it in and inhale it. This is the best big fish bait in this area that you can get because we don't have a lot of trout eaters around here. And so going with a big swim bait profile like this that you can slowly drag on the bottom absolutely devastates them. Um, again, this is the American trash fish. It comes in a six inch and it comes in a four inch. Um, the four inch is a fantastic pond bait, but the key is guys, you don't just reel it back to the boat. It won't work. It actually, it'll start rolling on hmm. itself because it's so soft, but if you creep it, it'll stay nose up like Jared was talking about, but you have all these appendages that will vibrate and bounce every time it hits something mm -hmm. and it drives them crazy. Hmm. So that is like one of my favorite big fish baits to use right now. Um, oh, what do we got here? Got a couple of questions. Um, there's Chris, CT Custom Spinner Baits. I like using a, a swing, uh, swim, swim jig, sorry, swing, swim jig. Uh, uh, freedom head with a small swim mm. bait this time of year. Yeah, again, and it, guys, it doesn't have to be the American Trash Fish. I know people were asking what my, my perfect favorite one is. It's that one. They're just hard to get. Any swim bait will work as long as it's super soft. And you just want it to just slowly bump bottom. Because every time it hits something, that, that tail is going to shimmer. And you can also go to mm. boot tails, things like that. But... I don't think I'm the best person to talk about that. Go to Tactical Bass and Matt Allen. You know, he's a big swim bait guru to talk about that. But again, swim baits in the wintertime are really good, even for smallmouth. I know mm -hmm. jerk baits that is on my list. I'm going to bring up jerk baits too. And I, I bet Jared will too. Um, but a swim bait is also something that's a little bit different because you want to slowly creep it and bump around the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. We got a couple more questions. Looney also great with the scrounger heads. Yes. Good Scr point. Scrounger heads. Yes. Um, so you great. Try yep. You got that mm -hmm. one. Oh, wait, uh, for $2, Brandon Sol Solis, what pond and bait were you fishing in the snow? Oh, you mean my, um, Your brother, my short thing. Yeah. With Billy, that was, um, that was, um, Jim Burnett park. That was Wilkinson, Wilkinson. Lake. Mm -hmm. Uh, the crankbait I was using, it was a, it was not a, it was not this one. This is a, what is this? this is a chip magnet. Fritz side. This is a fritz side, but these are flat sided crankbaits. I think I was using a bomber, I think, but the point is it was a flat sided crankbait there and it was a snowstorm. I think it was about two years ago when we were, when he you knows last year he was playing baseball. So date that. And we kept fishing rods in our dorm. And so when it snowed, we walked over and started to fish that thing. Mm -hmm. As soon as that snow hit the day before <clears throat> fishing was terrible. The day after the fishing was bad that day when the snow, the, the snow was coming down hard, the fishing was fire. He caught one on a, he caught a trout on a crankbait. I caught two or three bass on a crankbait, That's cool. but it has to do with the snow. I don't know why, yeah. but they were chewing and they mm -hmm. wouldn't hit anything, but that flat side of crankbait. Mm -hmm. And I think it was interesting. Like what you said, we, we were burning it. We mm -hmm. were burning around the bottom. It wasn't this yeah. slow thing, which yeah. I don't know no, why right. that is, but and, uh, anyway, um, let's see. Jake's fishing. the DMV. What is this? Roger Merritt, Jake's needs a fish in the DMV box or section around the store or oh, a that's seat good on. Good ideas, Roger. Um, yeah, like we it. will we will torture Jenny. With no, I like that. We've <laughs> talked, we've done that before, uh, like a name cap. Um, I'll put, you know, Roger, we'll probably do that. Uh, we got a little spinners, and we can if it's we 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 have talked about it. If it's mentioned, we should we, we should be. We'll add it to the list of to dos. <laughs> What's that? And we'll add it to the to do list. Yeah, uh, that's right. There's something else I was going to show you, but anyway, your your turn once you get a chance to interact. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as he said, the jerk bait, uh, the Mega Bass One Ten. This is a junior, One Ten Plus One. Um, you know, guys, any jerk bait. Um, 
you know, jerk bait is not is something I've had to gain confidence in. Although in saying that on the river, the original Rapella, you know, the floating minnow, jerk it down just on the subsurface, always had a lot of confidence in that. Uh, you know, fishing lakes or even the river, this idea of, and even the paws, what, we have a hard time this time of year of those of us that like working fast, you know, on, yeah. you know, reaction type baits, it's hard to slow down, but this time of year, uh, gaining confidence in throwing it out, getting it down and then just letting it float. They talked about the river seminar, 30 seconds to a minute, just let it dead stick, be still. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but fish will rise and come up and eat it, uh, on the pause. Um, you can vary your retrieves, things like that, but, um, lakes, rivers, uh, and, and what, another thing at the river seminar that kind of goes along with that, they talked about how many like bait fish that are still, you know, whether in schools or that are still in the water swimming around. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not going anywhere just because it's winter time. Yeah, that's you know? true. So they're still active and, the, and these fish are going to be eating on those. And so, um, you know, jerk bait, varying sizes, varying depths. That deadlift technique um, was interesting about just like leaving it behind the boat. Yes. I've never heard that before yep. until that seminar. Yeah. Like that was, yeah, that was new to me. Again, guys, I, I keep learning things. <laughs> right. Again, I still keep learning things. Um, jerk bait wise, guys, I have a box of them and we'll, we'll get into that because my brother and I literally, I think the first time I met Jared for a seminar, with, with that I did with him about college fishing, team fishing. We talked about the jerk baits. This was asked, and I think one of you even messaged me asking what snaps I use. This is the Strike mm. King one. And so what's so nice about these, and again, this was to save money, because if you're jerk bait fishing, hmm. you are going to experiment with color. You're going to experiment with size and stuff. Instead of having to cut and retie, you get one of these snaps right here. And again, I'll link this in the episode description. Um, and maybe we'll carry these at, at Jake's. They're, they're super cheap. But it's just a little snap swivel right here that you tie onto your line and you can quickly adjust the baits. And I think this is very important when you're dealing with jerk baits because jerk baits, I truly think to get a fish to commit to it, it's a visual bait first and foremost. And so this is, I took four boxes of jerk baits and I threw them all into just one for today to be able to talk about this because I think this is something that, that, that I think a lot of prof professionals miss. You could tell like that one right there has been freaking chewed on um i think colors are really important mm -hmm. i think the mega bass junior is the is one of the best cold water jerk baits period however i always want to say that there needs to be a budget option strike king is another mm -hmm. good company that makes a lot of budget friendly ones and this is important mm -hmm. because if let's say you're a kid that's washing right now and you get 20 bucks for christmas you could buy one mega bass junior or mm -hmm. come into jake's and you can get a cheaper version and you can get two or three jerk baits mm -hmm. of different colors that way you have a backup and mm -hmm. you can experiment mm -hmm. exactly I, right it, it's just i think that's what's so freaking important there because if if you're fishing let's say the shenandoah river and i see this a lot when it comes to like a gold and a natural color so let's say you're fishing the day and it's super gin clear no no clouds in the sky you're gonna go with more of a natural gold hue then all of a sudden the clouds roll in, you can switch up to a sexy shad hmm. and that chrome. And that can be a difference, especially with smallmouth mm -hmm. bass who are such visual predators to get them to commit mm -hmm. and want to swipe at mm -hmm. that bait. Um, when I tell people to do jerk bait fishing, I think there's a couple of colors you always need besides bone, which is a gold and a bright silver and then natural gold and silver, depending on the water has a better reflective ability. So example is down in Florida, gold is huge because of that tannic water. Gold shows up a lot better. It has a better flash and also mimics a lot of the shiners and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in super, super gin clear water, silver is fantastic because mm -hmm. it'll really reflect. So when my brother and I would go down to like Hartwell, Murray, Kiwi for tournaments where you had insane visibility, you would go with that silver one in certain days because when you'd snap that thing, that thing would reflect a lot of light and mm -hmm. it would really bring in the spots. Mm -hmm. I've had great success with gold for smallmouth for some reason. I don't know why it, it works for them. Let me pull this thing out of here without losing a finger. And then here's a good one. I think this one's made by Trout Magnet, actually. Again, guys, I'm like, I, I have a problem. This is why you're not allowed to drink when you stuff online. Too. But this one right here, uh, I think Striking also, not Striking, uh, Lucky Craft makes a really good gold mm -hmm. color. But you see that, that, sh that, that hue it has? And this also mimics a lot of minnows that are on the Shenandoah, mm -hmm. too. So I would always tell my, my young anglers, if they're watching, get yourself a gold jerkbait, mm -hmm. a silver jerkbait, 
and a white jerk bait. And mm -hmm. then if you have a little money left over, get a clear. Mm -hmm. If you have all those colors, you will get a jerk bait bite dialed in better than any mm -hmm. angler on the boat that just has one. Mm -hmm. And this is what you do. And this is my, my, if whether you have forward facing sonar or not, if you're fishing these things and you start seeing fish following, but not committing, mm -hmm. that means you're close to having it right, but you're not completely dialed mm -hmm. in. Adjust the color a little bit, but That's stay right. with the jerk bait. Right. Um, if you guys have questions about jerk baits, ask them. If not, I'll just stop talking about them. <laughs> Chris Gorsuch also, if I'm not mistaken, talked about a bite that he had recently on Susquehanna where he downsized yes. to, and that made all the difference in the world. So uh, trout guys talk about match the hatch. So, you know, sometimes that size, sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it does. And like you said, that's a great point about your snap swivels too, of just being able to experiment with it. And you can, you can move it. So these right out. here. These are at Jake's Bait and Tackle right now, too. This mm. is the Euro Tackle. Mm -hmm. And I, I do not... Oh, here's a pencil. There you go. Uh, yeah. Just give you guys some some ideas here. That's how small that thing is. Mm. It is uber tiny. Good quality, too, though. It's small. really so. good quality. And then this one I found at a dollar store, uh, I think in West Virginia. It is a trout magnet jerk bait. Same size, super small. It has a little bit different profile, but it has that, that sexy shad color. Um, I've actually murdered smallmouth and creeks with these two which is mm -hmm. a lot of fun so if you wanted a bag just to be able to put in your golf cart mm -hmm. or like you travel these baby jerk baits are just so much freaking mm -hmm. fun i really like those um, smithwick is another brand as he was talking about oh, them that is, yeah. is a is an inexpensive brand and i had read a while back how they have a a tighter slower type of uh wobble that is good for cold water i've had some big smallmouth in the summertime on a smithwick it was what I love too, and I had a guide come in. Another guide asked me about you know jerk baits, um, and my suggestions or whatever. And I, I told him about a Smithwick. Well, sure enough, that next week I read a Bass Times article where it talked about fishing shallow and cold, but it also it talked about the Smithwick. So, you know, some of this stuff is again personal preference, confidence, but also, you know, there is something behind it because you got to realize too, they're manufacturing. They're spending a lot of money to be able to produce something that's going to hopefully, you know, catch fish. Yes. So there is this, maybe what I'm trying to say is there is a science behind it too, also. And, and, you know, you guys have also asked questions before. I think I was on the last, last minute live that I forgot to answer, which was like certain baits you asked my opinion on. I, I really am trying to be kind of like neutral. Mm -hmm. and I think it's like the, the tactical bassin thing of like, mm -hmm. I'll talk about baits that I've used. I'm not mm -hmm. going to talk about baits I haven't used. Good and point. then, so example is I'm actually buying these two baits today which are these flat side of crankbaits to try them out this winter just mm -hmm. so I can actually give a review of them mm -hmm. um, so I can talk to you about it. That Fritz side is going to get um, down quicker. It's way in the front, and it's going to get deep quick. Um, yeah, we've had good luck on that. Oh, it was also Cam. Was it Cam that actually did a video yeah, last year? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, he did water, one too. Exactly right. Who's an up-and-coming content creator too. Um, let's see. We've got a couple more questions here, and then we're going to be uh, – we'll be wrapping it up for this evening here. we got – let's see, Christopher um, – you want to go by Chris or Christopher, dude? I just want to make sure. Uh, again, he has a spinnerbait company. We'll link that in the episode description. If that's something you want to get into. Uh, another winter bait I haven't heard or talked about in a while is the hair jigs. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I've fished them in the past. Um, well, there it is. <laughs> We're going to get into that right now. Um, I used to fish hair jigs a lot in the summertime in creeks for smallmouth. I don't really fish them a lot in the winter time as much as I should. And I'm not sheepish about me. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it's because I didn't fish as much smallmouth in the winter time as largemouth. I, I don't know. And again, it's like, how do you fish them? I know like there's some that, that fish are like a jig on the bottom. And I have others who like actually do the old school, like float and fly or swim it. Like, do you have a lot of experience with that? Yeah. So, and basically Roger Fuller, uh, the Slingsville, West Virginia ties, hand ties. The, well, Roger does. He, he's going to make this hook. He's using an Arky style hook, which has got a nice head on it. He's tie, hand tying the deer hair, buck hair on this hook. Then he's dremeling in a weed guard. Um, Roger's the guy, kind of guy that before 10 years ago when we opened, he was tying these things and giving them to his buddies. A lot of money has been run, won on, on river tournaments on this style hair jig, putting a little net bait crawl trailer, small trailer on it. And to your point, Thomas, fishing it slow on the bottom, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to be a crayfish imitation. This hair, there's something about hair, uh, whether it be marabou, deer hair, um, that just entices fish. Mm -hmm. It's a smaller profile. Uh, tubes and hair jigs are a, like, those are the two things that you hear most of these river rats are throwing 
tubes and hair jigs and probably jerk baits. But yes, I like a jig. Um, it's a little smaller, but winter time it's hard to beat. It, ca- it catches fish. Um, you could, to your point, I've heard guys too that would same thing I was saying before. They'd be bringing them back, kind of burning them back to go another cast, and those little you know flappers and the fish will mm-hmm. eat it. Smallmouth will eat it. So. Uh, Chris, good point. Hair jigs, very popular. Back. I need to bring this back. Um, the other thing, guys, I don't have them on me right now. I could try to run in the store and find them, which is like the the TRD mini tube. Um, if you guys have watched my Hidden Gym series, uh, oh, here we go. So this is this is one version of it. This is the TRD, uh, the mini TRD that Z-Man oh, makes. The and they also make a TRD mini tube, which is tickler. It's a tickler. This is basically it. But so, I like what he's saying yeah. is true, too. I almost grabbed that, the mini tube by z-man is is dynamite um these things are freaking awesome especially with super pressured fish uh mm-hmm. i did a hidden gyms at, at jim burnett park uh last year i think it was and i smoked some massive large amount of that pond on a micro tube and again it's also just pressure when this fish gets super pressured and these mm-hmm. ticklers are actually it's basically a tube here mm-hmm. it's going down in size downing sizing your line and mm-hmm. just getting those bites in high pressure situations whether it's do because of weather or because of anglers so it's a very it's a really good bait definitely add that to your and guys list. not just river smallmouth largemouth um maybe a lot of my fish up lake holiday and i mean largemouth same thing those mini tubes um they're gonna eat it i mean that was my other thing downsize when it gets cold that's the other thing i like to do is downsize um even the little minnows like the small paddle tail uh go small mm-hmm. try it uh, do a little ball jig hook. Um, uh, it's proportionally to the size that you're using. And yes. I can promise you big fish will eat these small little profile. And you'll have more success on the water. And mm-hmm. again, I think I've talked about this too, um, which is like BFS gear, ultra lights going mm-hmm. with that micro stuff. It's really nice to have, especially with the pressure, like the more these fisheries get pounded, the mm-hmm. more that finesse stuff, that Japanese California style stuff is going to come into play. Mm-hmm. Um, I talked about that, you know, I spent last year really honing in the BFS style, which is the mm-hmm. baitcaster finesse system, because you can throw this stuff and there's some benefits to that. Uh, and I think that's something you guys should probably research a little bit on your own. If that's something you want me to talk about more, do like an episode on just BFS gear, I can, but get yourself an ultralight or a medium light rod. Mm-hmm. And what's nice is with this and these tiny jerk baits, you can go catch mm-hmm. trout you can catch right. smallmouth you can creek fish you can catch bluegill mm-hmm. you can have a lot of fun and it's not just tournament fishing and but then this stuff if you keep it in your boat there will be a tournament mm-hmm. where you're gonna need one bite and having that little panic that's creek right. box it's it's gonna help yeah, you out that's right um i think guys were pretty much good oh one more bait I forgot. uh these are important and if you are a river smallmouth guy i highly suggest this Five oh, eights. Yeah, I thought about that too. Yep. A lot of companies out there. Um, Jake's has them all. This is the dual realis. Also, Spro makes one. These things are absolutely deadly on river smallmouth. Absolutely freaking deadly. What you wanted, and actually, Lake Anna. They're in designed. The time. I really, I realized too. They're designed for the the deep, clear lakes. Mm-hmm. Even anything clear, very subtle finesse. It was told to me, and here's some juice. These things are awesome when the jerkbait bite dies. Mm. These things attack the same fish that the jerkbait does, but they're just super finessey. Mm-hmm. So if you get on a good Lake Anna, I think Lake Anna in March for people that are going to be fishing tournaments too, and you just want to cash a check or, or just you know be able to fill out a limit, if you had a jerkbait bite going, go to this mm-hmm. and make sure you hit the spot with this before you leave. Mm-hmm. When you slowly reel this thing into the water, what happens based on, on the design it's just going to shimmy mm-hmm. back and forth. Yep. So that's part one of this thing. And all you're going to do is slowly reel it. It's going to feel like you're pulling a pencil through the water. But then there's part two. And this blew, this blew away Shane Flynn Outdoors when I did it, when we were actually live scoping fish, is a fish came up to this thing and was sharking it, but didn't want to commit. I opened the spool. I was using spinning gear. And when you do that, this thing shimmies straight down. Yep. And as soon as I popped the bail, it followed it down and then it ate it. So it's really nice. It can be used mm-hmm. for two things. You can cast it out and let it drop. And on the drop, you could get bit. And yep. then slowly reeling it back, you can get bit as well. Yep. One suggestion I have is the back hook always go with a triple grip, a small triple grip if possible, because those fish, again, just like a swimmate, they're going to shark it. And a lot of times they're going to grab right here and eat the back hook. So make sure that back hook is, is 
really good and sturdy to be able to handle them. But this will catch river smallmouth. It has. Um, the last thing I have not experimented with yet, but I'm going to, I think I'm going to go out with Travis Eden this winter, is an umbrella rig for river smallmouth. Mm -hmm. I want to try that, but I'm going to report on that after I've mm -hmm. actually fished a little bit to see if it works. So he's dead on that spy bait. Um, that That is exactly right. It's weighted in the bottom, and it's going to just kind of do this number as it falls, and you're you're 100% right. And if you do any research on spy baiting, that's what they talk about, just sometimes as slow as you can. Boring reel it just be, try to keep it off the bottom because they are sticky yeah. hooks and you'll get hung up but you are very right on that that is something that a lot of people aren't throwing uh that is people is get mad finesse. when i start talking about yeah. that stuff but um i mean spoiler they guys like when i won the potomac tournament that big one i was throwing a spy bait i caught two fish on a spy bait um it, and this is the title potomac river and Woman. i threw it mm -hmm. on a spy bait and it was mm -hmm. because we were catching them on jerk bait in practice and they stopped biting and there was more mm -hmm. pressure because of bows. I'm like, well, they're here. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what hurts a lot of anglers. You get set where it's like, well, you, you can only throw these baits because <clears> it's the Potomac. And I think if you clear your mind, it's like, well, no, throw the tackle box at them. And I finally got to that and they mm -hmm. would bite that. Yeah. So don't like, don't have a blocked off mind when it right, comes to this correct. stuff. Experiment. Yeah. Brian you know, Brown, uh, Lake Frederick, uh, threw it out long cast stuck the rod under his arm was cleaning his glasses and that thing is just again just doing this number gets his rod back bam fish on like you know really? six, six pounder so but it's cool i mean it do nothing like it wasn't like you know but you're yeah. right it has such good it was designed and built for that and they're it's enticing i guess it, they, it, they eat it, it really is um and if you look on their website like up out west and stuff the small mouth that they show are just They'll hammers I mean, yeah. big. We're talking big smallmouth. And, and the smallmouth was actually like so, a byproduct of that because yes. it was built for largemouth. Right. But the smallmouth, like, absolutely just love it. And again, guys, I started throwing this. It was not on smallmouth. It was, we were fishing, Um, I think it was like, no, it was like Kiwi. We we went down there twice for pre-practice, like once in November for Thanksgiving break and stuff. And we got on that spy bait deal at, to be able to get those schooling fish because mm -hmm. these things cast insanely well it's yes. a weighted bullet yep. and so if you put that on like 10 pound braid with mm -hmm. eight pound fluorocarbon you can cast about 10 miles mm -hmm. like it, it, it has great distance and so if you're dealing with schooling fish and again a lot of people start tournaments at smith mountain lake or lake anna usually here if you're out there have one of those on your deck because mm -hmm. let's say they push herring or something up to the surface mm -hmm. you can reach them with that thing you That's cast right. that out there you will get bit by That's something right. period do a realis has two different models so one you is designed to throw on a bait caster and one's mm. designed to yep. throw on a spinning rod. So that's what's cool too. So just if you do go decide to pull the trigger on one, just pay attention to that and maybe get one of each, whatever, whatever your style is. No, that that's a, that's a great, great point, Thomas. Very and then good. um, yeah, is there anything I guess, guys, while we're wrapping up here, I'm gonna go through the chat before I, I log off here, guys, just to make sure I got everybody's questions. But is there uh is there anything going on with the Jakes that we want to talk about or just promote or anything like that going on? Um we had that good river seminar. We thank oh, everybody right. that came out and or logged on and uh we had a lot of good information there um and then so we're all we're always trying to like you know what's the next thing uh we do have a uh in the works we haven't put a date to it yet we're trying to find the venue but a uh, pond lake fishery management uh this guy's a uh second generation hatchery guy out of ohio is going to come in and, and talk to us no, it's going to be made. It's we're going to, it's going to be specific to Lake holiday, which I know is a private Lake, but he has experience in pond management. And so we're going to open it up to anybody and everybody that maybe has a pond or Lake or what is interesting in fishery management. Uh, that's going to be hopefully coming up in January or February. And then we've, we've been talking about doing something else in February. Um, so we just, we want to, you know, continue doing things like we did to get information and knowledge out to our, to our customers. Uh, like you said, Richmond, uh, we're going to be down in Richmond. Yep. So that's yeah, 19, Richmond 20, up. and 21st of January. Um, so look look for us down there. Let's see, guys. I'm just going through the Super Chance. Make sure. I think this one by Scott. If you went with every square will fish format. Okay, we already did that one. Looney, we did that one. Uh, lithium blowing up. Let's see. Uh, we did that one. That one's good. Again, guys thank you so much for your super chat donations i really do appreciate it just so we can help grow the camera i'm trying to get a new camera i know you guys are seeing that one of the cameras always flickers on and off and so i'm trying to save up to be able to get a new camera which will also help us for live stream events so every donation guys is just going right back into the business it, you know i'm not pocketing anything right now 
Um, and one thing he's looking to, Thomas is doing a great job of just, I mean, a little every year end, and he just continues to grow it and bring different features, bring a lot of different content. You know, we went to ICAST last year, going to do Richmond this year, and just uh, Berkeley Springs. We're going back to Berkeley Springs. Berkeley Springs. I think in March. But, uh, you know, just uh, it's a good thing. He's consistent with it and uh, just looking forward to to what he has for the future. I see. Yep. They are selling that. And then, yeah. And guys, thank, thanks to Jake's um, and our partnership to be able to just be able to get this off the ground and to develop as we are. I think we have um, in January, I'm going to be talking to Charlie of New Horizon Bass. I'm going to go to the flea market in some mm. recall. I want to give back to Charlie. It was literally, and it'd be nice to talk to Charlie because I grew up in Fairfax guys. I grew up in like the city and mm. it was the new horizon kid tournaments that really got me into it where mm. you could just catch a fish and, and measure it and, and they'd have prizes and stuff. Mm. And so I, I really would like to give back to, to new horizon a little bit because they do run a good organization, especially. Um, and I, again, I can't I talk their praises enough. I can speak. They're a very good club. If you just want to get into it because it's very much about friendship and learning. Yes. And I really think that's awesome from a, a small club because I feel like a lot of small clubs, they get so big on like, Oh, we're basically pro anglers. No, you're not. You're a club. And right. to have that vibe of that companionship and camaraderie. Um, and I remember one term I went there with, with my brother, it's like, after you guys weigh in, you have to tell everyone what you caught. Yeah. That's or pretty cool. Yeah. That is such a cool idea. Yeah, that is. You know, so yeah, you're exactly right. Cause then yeah, comp competition can sometimes bring out the worst in us too. And, yes. Uh, but to your point, uh, that sharing of information and knowledge, is critical it is and i think we're all caught up on the super chats and all the chats so guys that is awesome i do want to say so our winner of the of the gift card and just measure out to me uh we're gonna go with scott fowler uh scott congratulations you won again guys when we do these live streams any comments that you do or any questions that you ask with the super chance the super chat function will enter you in a chance to win prizes um again super chat function going forward so scott you are the winner of today's prize and just keep an eye out for every live stream we do that's what we're going to start doing just to do giveaways and have better fan interaction so message me dude on facebook uh, or instagram and we can get that to you again you know have a great christmas everyone i really appreciate this um i think we had over 200 people within two days either come to the event in person, the mm. river seminar or watch it. Mm. It was a very big success. Um, mm. And it's something I want to continue to do. And like Jerry said, we're going to evolve this. And I had, and I'll leave you with this thought is I really want to grow the community. Yes. Um, I had two guys come up to me that listened to the podcast that just moved here. And they're like, until mm. I listened to the podcast, I didn't know how to get involved in the fishing community. I didn't mm. know where to go. And mm. so what they asked me is, would that be something we do where we either have, a lunch or a dinner mm -hmm. where we have just a meet and greet and we could just talk fishing. Mm -hmm. I want to do more seminars, of course, but I want to ask you guys, would that be something you're interested in where at Jake's I buy a couple of pizzas and we just have an evening in the winter where we can all just get together and just mm -hmm. talk fishing. Cause I think that would be fun. That's really strong Thomas. And I've heard people say, I've heard it said when it talked about marketing and stuff and how like a tackle shop can be intimidating to people. And I thought, how is that? But when you, like you're saying, if you're new to it, mm -hmm. we get a lot of new people come in. I just want to let everybody know. And Thomas is this way. We're this way. You can walk in here and there's no, whether you're a tournament angler and mm -hmm. you're the best of the best, or you're just starting and you fished when you're 12 and you're getting back into it. And I had a guy in the other day in the different styles. They, they Some guys are fly fishermen, but they don't, you know, freshwater spin fish. And so we're here to help you. And like you're saying, it's a non-threatening environment. It doesn't matter how much you know or don't know. There's no wrong way doing it. And we're always going to try to come at it from this, where you're at, take it from where you're at and try to help you have success mm -hmm. based on where you're at. And so uh, just know that if you're sitting out there and you're a little apprehensive about getting back into this because you, you don't think you know, don't worry about that. Just walk through the door, come in, and we're going to help you out. If we don't know, we're going to find somebody else that does. Uh, real quick plug too for Lonnie Connor. He was on here oh, yep. as an example. He just retired from the police force and he there, he and Jason Ford are going to do kind of a little guide service. Uh, last story for me, had a couple come in, they were doing some Christmas shopping for their son. And, and so, and wanted him to learn more and how can you do that? And so I turned, uh, gave him Lonnie's information and Lonnie, and that's what I love about people like Lonnie that just mm -hmm. say Ricky Folk was the same way. Ricky. Yeah. Like, gosh, I'm getting older and I've been doing this a long time and I just want to help others 
learn and be able to catch fish. And to me, that is, so we're passing on that information, knowledge, techniques, whatever that is to help them have success. That's what it's all about. And it's building and, our community. Yes. And I think when we started this podcast, I, I didn't realize truly how tribalistic mm. it was between mm. like the flathead get fishermen, right. the trout, the bass, the right. tournament pros. That's right. And you saw that at Lake Holiday. Um, and uh, again, this will be my one accident where you said like, well, I don't want to help the river with, with mm. the lake with little fish because I won't be here or whatever. Right. And it's like that mindset. And what's so nice about doing this podcast and, and, and doing this group stuff is mm -hmm. like a community can be across species. It can be across many That's things. Right. We're all here about the fish and the water. Correct. And if we all come together, we can actually make a difference. That's awesome. Very good. You know, good right? stuff. Keep Guys, it up, Thomas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, have a wonderful new year. We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.